Okay, so today's the weekly briefing. I am Matt Taylor, the Token Australian or the APAC uh, advisor. Um, I've been running Jumpstart with a bunch of great folks, some of whom are on this call, which is very exciting to see. And today we're going to do the weekly briefing about developing a business development mindset or how I learned to stop worrying and build a pipeline. And then tomorrow in Confab, we're going to actually discuss the six things I talk about and um, get everyone's opinions on that. So to start with, I used to hate business development. Uh, for a long time there, it was the, the worst thing in my life. Um, I was thoroughly convinced there was something I could never do and was the worst possible use of my time because I saw myself as a creative, damn it, and me selling was just was not how I should be spending my time. I carefully planned my business so I wouldn't have to sell as I felt that whenever I tried, I just got too keen uh, and blew it or that I was just out of my comfort zone. So I had a business development person who would take care of that and I would do whatever it took to not sell. And that, that was my, my plan was to avoid doing these things. But as Mike Tyson says, Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And unexpected things happen to me and my little studio that cause me to need to sell whether I like it or not. So the thrust of this talk is that if I could do this, you can too. And here are six flips in thinking that I've made that helped me develop a business development mindset because I believe that business development is a muscle and it's a, it's a learned skill. It's not something you're born with. It's something that you develop. And it's just changing your thinking around various things. First one of these is speaking engagements. And I know some people, the idea of speaking in front of people is, is a nightmare. Um, I did debating at school, so I feel quite comfortable speaking to strangers. Sometimes confronting someone one-on-one -on -one is confronting. But in terms of actually public speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. But let's rewind back to 2013, where my plan to have a business that I didn't sell had come off the rails. Um, it was six months into my new business. The business development guy that I hired turned out to be a crook. He had um, caused my producer to leave. I had my second child arriving in three months. And I needed to get some work in the door to keep this dream plan going. Um, I was daunted by this prospect, not sure how this was going to happen when the phone rang. And a spot had opened up at an industry design event. And did I want to present? So as I said before, public speaking wasn't something I was scared of, but I had no idea what to speak about. I had no idea what sort of opinions uh, people were interested in or what I had to really contribute to any design conversation of any worth. But one thing I did really like was the movie Inception. Inception is a movie I've watched like a billion times. It's like my go-to on a number of levels. And I love that idea um, about how thought leadership and I guess sharing ideas is, is like a virus, how it's something that uh, spreads to people. And I guess viral thinking isn't that different. But for me, this sort of take was that you could put the right story into someone else's head and make them feel the same way that you did about it and then, then tell other people about it. This felt like a fresh and a more calculated take on thought leadership, whereas previously, the talks I'd done before were more about, look at me, I'm a creative, here's the thing I've done. But this is about, I want people to see my opinions as their opinions. Because, you know, why do we go to industry events anyway? Like we go there because we're looking for fresh ideas to borrow or we're looking for solutions to problems we already have. So the talk I gave, I wanted it to be a rallying cry for marketers to take control of their own campaigns because I believe that this is the future and I wanted to work directly with clients and want them to see me as their ideal partner. So it was all about this solution. It was all about what, what they needed to get out of this. And for me, it worked. An insurance client walked up, gave me a card and I got my first direct client. So previous to this, every talk I'd given was about my work journey, about my creative development and showing off recent projects. It was all about having some hot new project to show off. One of the biggest talks I'd given was at semi-permanent. And while we're up on stage, we basically got so excited that we forgot to even have an ending to the presentation. It was, we was always talking like it was huge on passion, but it was low on point. Um, so I really tried to start focusing on what was the point of what I was 
speaking at any opportunity I got to talk about. Um, I tried to show the impact and the results that my work had had rather than just how pretty it was. Um, and the difference fundamentally was that now the conversation I was having with people started changing. It was more about them and it was less about me. Um, I did keep doing talks after this. I got hooked. I thought that I'd cracked it. And if I just talked more and more, I would get more and more work. Um, this didn't entirely happen because I started to get, uh, I, 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 I forgot to have a point. Um, I started to get more interested in trying to just come up with new opinions than I was about the problem that I was solving. So it isn't just about talking more. It, it's always thinking about well, whose problem you're solving, what's going on in their lives, what's, what's keeping them awake at night. And anything where you're not thinking about yourself is always a lot more constructive and a lot easier to deal with because when you're dealing with yourself, it's the, the terror of the blank page. And that's when I find your mind wipes and you go, oh, I have nothing to say. But if you start thinking about other people, visualizing those personas, thinking about what's keeping them up at night, it gets a bit easier. And suddenly I find it easier to, to develop opinions and um, by thinking about the audience and what they're looking for, what they want from me. So if you want them to listen, it's got to be about their challenges and not yours, despite what a creative genius you might be. The next one is experts travel. And I, but I like to think of it as like the power of the tropical bird. So if you've been through Jumpstart or with me, you will have had Joel, the king of the frequent flyer points, stress to you that experts travel. And you may have nodded along and you're still planning that business trip that you've never taken. But here's another way of looking at it. I think it was Tim at Hybrid Moon who pointed this out, but it, it's sad but true. You can't be a rock star in your hometown. Australians know this more than anyone. To get any sort of fame as an actor, Australians have to fly to America and develop an American accent before we can come back to Australia and be accepted by our own. But I'm pretty sure it's the same in every state, in every city, in every country. Um, you've got to get out of your own turf to start being recognised. Um, it's a really strange quirk of psychology that we don't want to accept the people that are around us. We want, to, we want someone new. We want someone foreign. Um, Consultants know this more than anyone. I once asked a partner in digital transformation at Deloitte, what was the first thing he did when he landed a huge banking client and was about to engage in a big digital transformation project? And he just said, the first thing I do is fly in an expert with a foreign accent. And that was literally the first thing he did. He would hold a workshop with a client and he would get in an Australian or get in someone from England and have them tell them the same thing that they could have heard. But the fact that it was coming from a fresh mouth and was hitting their ears differently was different. And also the fact that you'd come from somewhere else was different. Um, it's really hard to explain, but you'll be stunned by the power of being a tropical bird. The fact that you're from somewhere else and you've flown into their city immediately makes you different and more interesting. Novelty is a massively underrated factor in this world. I mean, I should know. My old band, we did Genesis covers and we played ukuleles and kazoos. We lent in hard to novelty and people shy from novelty like it's a dirty word, but novelty is delightful. We've got to embrace it. Um, and I think if you did, if you did jumpstart or you've been doing jumpstart, one thing we look at is the opportunity matrix. So when you start thinking about these people you'd love to work with, your dream clients, think about where they are. And then also think about who's nearby. Um, because by clustering your dream clients and the locations, you'll suddenly start forcing make, make decisions. Is, you know, is New York more valuable to me than LA? Is Michigan more valuable to me than Minneapolis? Um, you, you, you know, if you're into, I know Brian's on this, on this call from Nifty, he's into um, extreme sports and, and looking at outdoor, outdoor sports clients. Which city matters the most to him? And where are you going to put your dollars down? I mean, one of the things about business development when you're running a small studio, it's, it's probably just you. You don't have a lot of resources to throw at this stuff. So you really want to make those small trips count. So if you make one or two trips a year, where are your dollars best spent? I think um, at Deloitte that I always talk about where to play and how to win. And they were often talking about industries, but literally we're talking about geographically, where are you going to play? Which cities are going to make the difference to you? So when you go away, to invest those two days a year in visiting people, which city, which block, which part of that city is going to matter the most and who's nearby that you can call on. 
One, um, one great thing is that I just had a client um, uh, from Melbourne. He had never done this before. I think when we first started working together, he was saying to me, I've, I've never taken a business trip. That is the, the most painful thing I possibly could do. You know, we worked together. We, we practiced the emails. We, we, uh, we rehearsed what his opening gambit was going to be when he opened up the room and said, hey, I'm, I'm Cam from this studio. But the most important thing is just locking in that first meeting. Like when you're planning that trip, if you can anchor it with that first meeting, you'll be amazed how the other ones will fall into place. He got the first meeting, you know, a second meeting came, but still he was like, that's two meetings in two days. Is that really worth it? But in the last two days, four more meetings with agencies he'd never met magically fell into his lap. And before we knew it, we had two days, six meetings. We met in the bar of his hotel, had cocktails. It was super exciting. I felt like a proud parent because he'd done it. He reached out and he met a bunch of new people. We're waiting for that to actually become a valuable trip. But anytime you do this, you actually start making meaningful contacts and pushing it out there. And again, with novelty, I think the fact that you've bothered to go to someone's office and show up when you could have tried to arrange a Zoom call um, pays off in spades and is, 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 is a highly valuable thing. And the novelty of actually meeting someone in their office is, is tremendous too. I'm big on novelty, as you can see. Um, next thing is about magic and the magicians. And I guess once, you, once you've got the meeting, once you've gone in there, how are you going to talk to these clients? Um, sometimes they're scary. Sometimes it's, uh, it's nerve-wracking. One of my nerve-wracking experiences talking to clients was my first global gig at Deloitte. Um, so I guess I'd never been employed before. I sold my studio to Deloitte. I went into this big business. Uh, I was still wondering what I was doing. And about three months in, they gave me the gig of creating the global narrative for Deloitte's digital technology practice. And I was freaking out. I was out of my depth. Um, they flew me to New York from Sydney. So I was there at 30 Rock, looking out at this view, um, wondering how I was going to do this. Um, and on top of this, when I got up to speak to um, open my presentation, I pre prepared the, um, the global Chief Technology Officer Bill Briggs in his Kansas City accent just said to me, hey, Matt, good luck. You're going to magic the magicians. And um, I was like, man, don't do that to me. I've got to, um, I'm trying to present to you. And uh, yeah, I had these 30 C-suite guys staring at me. But 24 hours later, I had them applauding me and they were all giving me, um, they were standing up and clapping about what I'd, what I'd said and what I'd made to them. I was sort of still stunned. I was going, what the hell did I do? Like I knew I'd done the thing I was there to do, but it was the fact that we'd had such a flip and such a role reversal um, stunned me because I didn't understand how I could have actually done my job so well. And I guess what I learned then was that being an expert doesn't mean you need to be the smartest person in the room. This room was filled with people whose job was to be the smartest person in the room. And they were all outsmarting each other the whole time. But what I'd done is I was the clearest person. And I showed them a clear way and a simple way of actually telling their story. And that was mind boggling for them. The fact that I could tell a case study, case study with a graphic and two bits of information on one page, or the fact that I could just come up with a, a three paragraph poem to sum up their whole business when they used to using a 60 page PowerPoint deck is mind boggling. So I, you know, I, it's maddeningly simple, but you have to keep coming back to being a human being. And you have to keep coming back to being simple. Um, being a creative entrepreneur is all about being a simple and clear communicator. It's not about dazzling people with buzzwords and jargon. I think, you know, your job is to make things simpler and not harder. There are enough people out there using too many words that don't make any sense. And I think with ChatGPT coming in and being used more obviously, people are going to be throwing word salads out all over the place. So whatever you can do to simplify it, the story and simplify the situation is, is what's going to make you the expert. Um, so be clear, be simple, show them what a solution looks like. I had to keep coming back to this every time at Deloitte. Um, I would start to learn more jargon and more buzzwords. And then someone would say to me, but isn't it about telling the human story? I'm like, of course it is. I can't believe you're telling me that. That's my job to tell you that. But it's obvious, but it's, it takes a long time to write a short letter, as Abraham Lincoln said. Um, the last one is, well, the next one is about sales psychology. And 
I think when it's when it comes to start making you know sales target lists, we have this this tendency to just add more and more numbers and more and more uh, people to them. Um, but sometimes I think we we keep making these long lists so we can actually avoid connecting to the people that we put on there. It's like I'm I'm doing this dev. I'm just adding more people to my wish list. I'm I'm, I'm finding more targets. I'm reaching out. But we just keep adding to the list and we don't actually start targeting them. You need to set a small number of targets and connect with them meaningfully. And by selling less, you will sell more. So when I was selling at Deloitte, it, pardon my French, but it was a mind fuck. You were, you were selling internally. You, you never actually really saw a client. My first two years there, I was being dragged around to countless partners and paraded as this new toy that they could take out to their clients. It was like being in this crazy corporate marketplace where everyone was trying to out haggle each other all the time. Um, I was doing eight meetings a day. I'd sort of lost track of who I was meeting with. Sometimes I would leave my possessions randomly around the building and have to try and retrace my steps to find my laptop charger because I was in a daze of doing meetings. And um, I was not selling a lot. The way uh, Deloitte here works is there are 800 partners internally. They all had separate clients. And trying to sell to all of them at the same time was doing my head in. But over the next two years, I totally changed my tactics. I found um, I basically made my offering five times more expensive. And, um, and by, by, by trying to sell bigger things and more sort of conclusive deals, it, it, it closed the field. When I was trying to sell 30 to 50K videos, it was too small for some of the big partners and just too much for the small ones. So like that was the price that I needed to sell things at, but people either couldn't be bothered or couldn't afford them. But by selling a more expensive product, when I tried to sell a, a 200, 300K project, suddenly what I was selling was of an interest to a very small elite group of partners who actually had the clients with the real budgets. When I looked at those 800 partners with that, we made around $3 million revenue. Um, it was confusing. But by suddenly by having this bigger offering that was really only relevant to people who were selling 16 to $20 million revenue a year, um, that just narrowed the field down to 20 partners that I had to talk to. And the good news was I already knew five of them. So, and then 10 of them were probably never going to speak to me anyway. So that left me just another five people to talk to. I was given a target of selling eight things that year. I sold nine. So I actually made my first, beat my first target at Deloitte, which was mind boggling and it had taken me three years to get there. But more and more I find that by trying to sell less to more people, by trying to sell more to less people, you will find it's a slower path to sale, but you will ultimately benefit more. And it's, I think it's a better use of your energy. Now, how this actually applies, I guess people call this the 80-20 rule, um, that the fact that 20% of your clients bring in 80% of your income. So I would encourage you to really focus on that 20. I think there's this huge tendency to um, to build this big list of people you want to speak to, to keep endlessly chucking more people onto that list, like logs under a fire, but it doesn't work that way because you don't have that much time and you don't have that much resources and you don't have that much brain space to be able to focus on, the, on all these things at different times. Personally, um, when I was running my second studio, we would just focus on one industry or one vertical a month. So there were three industries we wanted to focus on, but you know, one month we'd do technology, one month we'd do health, one month we'd do government. And then we'd just go back and, and repeat. And it just meant that there were only like five or 10 clients that each month was really trying to put that effort into so that I'd follow it up with them two or three times. I tried to make contact, trying to think of new ways. And, um, you know, it's a lonely path contacting people in the cold. So you want to try and be able to keep your mind set on these people you want to contact with so that any trace, because they're going to, they, they will have looked at your email in their inbox. They will have registered you in some way. They may not have gotten back to you, but you'll be on their radar in, in some weird way or not. So one thing that uh, Jaken pointed out was when you look at your top 20 clients. So if you were to look at your, um, your accountancy program, and basically download where did your money come from in the last year and who are the top 20 people that actually gave you money rather than top 20 people you wish gave you money. Have you actually reached out to them? The fastest way to a sale is someone that you've already sold to. So you might find that by reconnecting with someone who you've been in business with already, you might be able to generate um, a new project within a month. 
generally, if you're working with someone who you've never worked with before, it'll take at least three months to make a cold lead become warm. So reach out to your top 20, but I would encourage you in the broader picture to, to focus on on the 20%, who are the, who are the ones that are going to matter? Who are the ones who you're offering and what you're selling directly relates to? And can you see that connection between your solution and that problem? In terms of video production, I guess one of the ways I've been looking at this, because you're not selling to consultants, is going through your competitors. Um, I was working with someone and we just went through Giant Ant's website, got Giant Ant's part of Buck. They don't need their website anymore. But if you want to find out like who's doing the work that you like and where do their jobs come from? I would go through your competitors and go through the credit list. So you can see here that this, you know, the bigger Nike jobs, they come from Shanghai in, this, in regards, they're working with a, with a production studio. So maybe it's not a direct contact when they got this job, but try to analyze. I make a spreadsheet of maybe um, six different competing studios who I'd like to be uh, up against. And I just look at where did that work come from? What's the split that they're doing with direct to client or with, um, with agency? And when they do direct to client, is that work coming via a production company or is it coming uh, literally from the client? So you can start to get the measure of where they find their work, what sort of work they're doing. Do they find the work directly from the client themselves or are they finding an ad agency or a branding studio or someone who's giving them an in? Um, I find that that, it takes away some of the uh, the mystique. Uh, it, it, it unveils the, uh, the 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 banners of I couldn't do that um, because you can see how these things came to them and and what sort of path they took to connect with these clients that you'd like to have, and then you can figure out how you can steal them. Um, next bit is conversion rates. So outreach is a thankless job. Cold calling is a total grind. And, um, but just like chopping logs, it's got to be done if you want to have a fire. But I think it's just finding the way and finding the number of people that you're going to reach out to and just setting that tone and making sure that every day you go out and chop five logs or each week you make sure you've connected with 10 people and then you just keep doing that because it's one of those things that does build and it does pay off. I think when people talk about conversion rates, um, I would say that like a 10 to one ratio is, is okay. That is pretty good. I found when I had a studio and I was selling, trying to sell to everyone, I think one of the complex things about video production nowadays is, you know, videos could be for everyone. Like literally anyone could use a video. Um, Kevin from Cabin Six is on this film. He sells to a, a broad range of clients who I've never even imagined selling to. Um, and I think, Again, it's and, and he's doing a great job of it. He is getting out there and trying to meet people and trying to address their problems. And it, it, it's a hustle. It's hard. And it's a lonely job where sometimes I even wonder if my computer's plugged into the internet. So like, I'm sending emails, but I'm getting no response. Um, you can get horribly paranoid that no one's talking to you or that you wrote something wrong. But fact is, they're busy. They've got other things on their mind and they may not need you right now, but they will need you at some point in the future. I did find that once I got more targeted with my business and once I was starting to focus particular sorts of clients with particular sorts of problems and really thinking about my offering in terms of like, what are the packages I can bring? How do I make it easy for people to understand how much I charge and what they get out of this? That uh, we got to about a, a five to one conversion rate and that was, that was good. Um, so in terms of numbers, I would be trying to look at these sort of numbers for conversion rates. Um, if you can do better than this, then hats off to you. I think it would be wonderful to, I, I, but I think the more that you understand who you're selling to, you understand the sort of size of job you're trying to sell them. Uh, and the more that you're going to pre-qualify these, um, these sales, the, the better those conversion, conversion rates will get. It's something we talk about in Jumpstart. It's like the three R's and the three D's, um, but running that process again and again in your head and really trying to focus on who are the people who are going to be the best fit for me? And how am I going to be the best fit for them? A lot of like trying to team up with business partners is like playing ping pong. You want to play against someone who, who can play at the same level as you, because then you'll have a good game of ping pong. There's nothing worse playing ping pong for someone who can't hit the ball back at you because you just serve and the ball goes off and you serve. It's, it's, it's a torment. You want to get a rally going. So you want to be the right fit for your clients and you want them to be the right fit for you.
outreach is a total numbers game and it's nothing, it's not you, it's them, but you got to keep chopping if you want to get that firewood cut. It's winter here. So I'm going to use um, fire burning analogies. I'm, I'm fixated on, on fires. And I guess the last point, the last flip in my mind was about thinking bigger. And I think, you know, having your own business is, it's a punish. It's a really hard job. And I think what you've chosen to do is a really hard endeavor um, because not only are you trying to be creative and not only are you trying to be inspired and not only are you trying to stay excited about it all the time, but you're trying to employ a small number of people and small business is hard. And one of the hardest things about it is the longer, longer you're going in it, um, it kicks the shit out of you. And it's hard to think bigger. It's hard to be thinking, um, having big Napoleonic thoughts about how you're going to take over the world all the time. But people call this a growth mindset. And I didn't really understand what a growth mindset was. Um, I thought it was just about loving money. Um, but what a growth mindset is, it's its willingness to learn. And I think this is something we've all got to keep in our minds. It's like, it's about accepting that you will need to grow, that you're going to need to constantly change and open yourself up to new ideas. Because, you know, as we've seen this year, um, this has been a huge year of change. There's been the rise of AI. There's been the advertising industry being knocked for six. There's been people questioning. I mean, in Australia, the uh, commercial TV channels are even firing their advertising apart. So even TV channels aren't investing in, in advertising production. But people are making more content than ever. But it's changing. It's being made in different places. It's being made by different people. It's being made in, in different ways. And so you need to, came, you need to have a flexible way of thinking um, to, to adapt to this. And you need to show people that you have a flexible way of thinking. Um, I got sick. And my last Deloitte story, I'm full of them. But basically, being at Deloitte was my time in the army. And I learned many things about people who like money. And one of them was my boss, Leon. And he prided himself on being a cool boss. But he was also a pretty ruthless Singaporean. Um, and like many Singaporeans, he'd done military service at 18. He had a domineering mother. And he loved money. He loved, he loved the idea of it. He loved the thrill of the chase of it. It was kind of like juxtaposed, juxtaposed to me as a creative because I love creative things. I love cool new things. And it took me a while to understand that he just loved money. Um, so I had my annual review coming up and I realized that if I was ever going to open his eyes up to my potential, I had to show him that I was more than just a stubborn creative who wanted to make cool things and over-invest in every project and that I got business. And I got the importance of money. And I guess that I got it for him. So for my annual review, I drew a big blank check on a piece of paper. And I slid it across the desk to him. I hadn't filled it out yet. But I just said to him, Leon, how much money do you want? And he was like, ooh. And he said, you realize this isn't a real check, don't you? And I said, yeah, yeah, I know it's not a real check. But how much money do you want? And he said, oh, I want $3 million. And I went, sure. Oh. And like I wrote him out a check for $3 million. And I signed it. And I said, I'll be back in a year. You know, I got him his $3 million, damn it. And I got him even more than that. And he, but he later then wrote to me and said he was impressed that I had a, a growth mindset. And I knew that he'd just taken this from Harvard Business Review and I didn't really understand what it meant. But I did know that it meant that I got through to him. And um, that was something I hadn't done in a very long time. But what it made me realize and what I've also seen in a few businesses is that no one can read your mind. Um, I think creatives are very good at having big ambitions and ideas that they hide to themselves and they don't share their ambitions with other people. But if you can share the ambition for your company, if you can share where you want to go with your clients when it's appropriate, of course, and, and with your team, people will get behind you and people want to see that you have a dream and people want to see where you want to go. And I genuinely believe that people want to help you get there. Like you will have some clients who are like, yes, they want to build their business. I want to be a part of it. This could help them do that. Your, your team wants to know that you want to go somewhere. You don't want to just make more things endlessly. I mean, running a production company, it, it's a grind. You're just, you're making more videos. You're selling more videos. It's just like job in, job out. People want to see the North Star, as they say in business parlance, but they want to see where you're going. What's the destination? What's this year's destination? What's next year's destination? I think that frequently business owners don't share where they want to go with those closest to them. You know, sometimes they, they, you might bore your partner with it in the middle of the night, but you don't tell the other people that it's probably more relevant to. So share your ambitions with people 
and and tell them where you want to go and, and tell them how meaningful your work is to them to you getting there and I, I i do believe that people will get behind you and that people will join you on your journey even if at times you feel like you're don quixote chasing windmills you need to tell people where you're going and share your plan you might still hate business development and you might still think that yeah yeah matt you've said all this stuff and i'm never going to do any of it but it's a learned skill. You're going to find your way of doing it. So please, if any of these flips matter to you, take them, use them, change them, abuse them, do whatever you want. But I think your biggest motivation is to have no surprises. You don't want 2023 to come punch you in the face. You want to be able to duck and wave and respond to those punches because as we've seen already, 2023 is totally ready to punch you in the face. It's punched a lot of people in the face. It's hard out there right now and you need to be prepared and you need to be flexible. And you need to be able to duck and weave with whatever life throws at you. And it's also to remember, important to remember that, you know, it's a, it's a shorter path to finding a project with your existing clients. So keep in touch with your top 20 or even your top five before rushing out to meet new people. Because business development takes time. You know, a lot of people compare business development to dating. And if you were dating, you wouldn't just rush straight into a marriage proposal in the first coffee. You need to get to know people. You need to understand what they want. You need to understand what you can offer them. You need to understand how this thing is going to work together because like, it sounds corny and people have said it all the time, but it's a relationship that you're trying to build. But don't rush into it. But do start. And do start today. Download your, um, your financial information. Have a look at who gave you money in the past. Find out who matters to you and reach out to someone today and then someone else tomorrow and someone else the day after that. And you'll have already reached out to three people. But it's a numbers game and it's a thankless task, but it pays off no matter how little, no how little, how much you do of it and your time starts now. So, and my time is over, but thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. So tomorrow we're gonna to have confab and we're gonna go through these six flips and if anything uh, was relevant to you or if this sparked any thoughts, um, I will put them up in the contact chat and please have a think and bring your thoughts to me. You can say, that's nonsense. Matt, you're just spilling off or please uh, let's discuss them. But I will be here. Uh, I'll be bright and early again in the Australian winter morning, ready to chat. Um, but till then, email someone. Email anyone, reach out to them. Just, just reach out to one person today and one person tomorrow and it'll make a difference. I guarantee it. And yes, business development is a total grind and it's a totally thankless task, but um, you're the one that decided to start a creative business. So it's up to you because no one can sell your business like you. Creative people are actually the best business people because they're the most passionate, crazy lunatics. And once they believe in something, they will sell the hell out of it. So, uh, Good luck. Hey, Ian, how you doing? Um, thank you. I'm going to sign off. I'll see you all tomorrow. And um, remember to email people. But thank you very much for turning up. Really appreciate it.